man now. Yeah. Can you show me? Yeah. Hi, guys. Thank you for coming to this event. I really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to start with Ogin, uh, Dr. Ogin, in, in just a bit. Um, but I want to kind of start a discussion here before we get um, Dr. Ogan on and uh, kind of get your ideas as to the current state of healthcare and, and what we can do to improve it. Um, so if you guys have any questions, I want to I want to address those questions. I want to uh, or you have any statements that you want to talk about or if you want to if you have topics that you like to discuss, you know, I'm happy to um, to uh, address those things with you guys and, and have a discussion here. Um, I, my, my stint in understanding, um, my stint in understanding pretty much why we need to improve healthcare is pretty much my dad, uh, got sick. I think everybody like 90, 99% of people that get into healthcare in this particular field, um, I think they do that because they had some type of experience with the healthcare system, the inefficiencies, the, um, the bad things that happen sometimes in healthcare, um, you know, to be honest, you know, let's just address the problem here. Uh, third leading cause of death is medical errors. The third leading cause of death is medical errors as a study done by John Hopkins University. And uh, so, you know, how do we improve that? How do we how do we make that better? So we need the medical device people, uh, CEOs to to make the healthcare system a lot better than what it currently is. And we need people to just and over, overall just have a forward thinking vision. Um, and as you know, you know, as an entrepreneur, as somebody who invests in healthcare companies, it's a very difficult process. You're going to get laughed at many cases until you make it, you know, like nobody sees the, the struggle that entrepreneurs go through in order to hit what they, um, what they've been trying to achieve, hit their dream. Um, and you know, what I really think that we should be cognizant of is we should, we should document that journey somehow. I've always been like interested in, um, in documenting my journey and for, for like people that I know in the future, for them to go and go back and watch how I did what I did. You know, I think that's always going to be interesting. In fact, you know, I almost want to do a series like questions from my daughter or questions for my daughter or who I am today versus who I will be things like that. So my, when my daughter, when I pass away, you know, um, you know, I don't know how many years, 60, 70 years with advancements of healthcare. Uh, my daughter can go back and watch and go and watch it, all the things that we went through in order to succeed. Um, I think that would be really, really interesting. And very similarly, we should probably have people following doctors, having uh, following, you know, medical device company CEOs and uh, biotech CEOs and digital health CEOs following their journey because people really relate to that. And that helps build the brain too. Too many people these days with regard to building a brand, try to build a brand that's based on superficial kind of uh, outward appearances that, uh, that don't really reflect reality. Uh, and what we need, right. We, what we need today is authenticity and sharing the journey uh, along the way. We need to share the journey uh, with, uh, we need to share the journey of the investors as well as the medical device CEOs. Um, in fact, we've had companies that present that are a million dollars, uh, you know, a year. And, you know, it didn't start that way. It was very, very difficult um, leading up to that. It took years and years and years and years to get to that point. Um, and then it takes a, a lot of years to get to the point where you net a million dollars. You know, it's, it's a lot easier to, to gross a million dollars to then net a million dollars. Um, so like, what do we do to share that story? What do we do to not only make the healthcare system better, but, but, uh, but share the journey of making it better. I think that's extremely important. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's in the chat and wants to ask a question regarding anything that we have to do with this conference or just anything in general regarding the healthcare system. Happy to chat about that. Um, but okay. So we have, uh, Dr. Ogan coming on in four minutes. And um, so while, I, while we're waiting for him, 
I want to share because I shared that uh, we do branding for this company. So I want to share two stories of a branding we did for a life science space. So I just want to give you the, the reality is we're very new to the life science space. We just entered the life science space in March. I thought it was a great opportunity and I've always loved healthcare. Um, so I have nine doctors in my family. Um, I've always loved healthcare and, uh, and I, I want to help in some way, in some way. Um, so we, we work with a company called case tabs <clears throat> and in case tabs, what they do is they provide, um, these communication platforms for surgeons, uh, for surgeons to communicate with their staff and, and any nurses. And, uh, it's just a really effective way to, to communicate in a, a surgeon's office. And, uh, what we did was they came to our event and this was an in-person event before COVID. And, uh, we had uh, Mark. Uh, the, Mark was a sales manager, the representative of the company. It was crazy. And uh, what we did is we shared a story during the conference, and Mark decided he's on his own dime. He's going to purchase, you know, our expensive package, uh, which is it's it's definitely expensive, and a lot of people, you know, think that, and that's why most of the audience didn't buy, but Mark did. He actually took it out of his own pocket and said, "I'm just going to hope that my company pays me back." And that's what, that's what happened. And so he, he invested and, uh, he got the company to pay him back. Uh, but what we did was we helped him and his entire sales team use LinkedIn to talk to more surgeons, to talk to more administrators of, uh, of these surgeon sur surgical facilities. Um, and the first thing we did was, if you guys don't know, one thing you have to do as a, as reaching out to a surgeon's office, you have to talk to the, um, front desk person, then you have to talk to multiple people, then administrator, then the, the administrator talks to the surgeon. And it's a long process. Well, we found a way for them to talk to surgeons directly consistently over time and the administrators um, whenever at, at will on demand. Um, and so <laughs> within the first, uh, just changing that one thing, changing that one process, um, what that did was it caused about $190,000 in contract to be closed within around a 45 day period just by changing that one thing. We then helped them post content on LinkedIn. We then helped them uh, reach out and create automated systems that um, stopped broadcast. Okay, so I'm reading something from the day before. Anyways, uh, so they, they created like $190,000 in contracts uh, within the first you know, uh, very short while period of time. And, uh, and this is, coming from a sales manager who invested his own money. He invested his own money um, to do this and hoped that we would do this. Now, his CEO was not a believer in it until we closed. Obviously, you get a result. You're, you're much more of a believer. But you know how many things do we pass on because we're not a believer and we don't think things would work when they actually do in reality? So I think what we need to do is focus on what's actually – work in reality what's what's actually being done currently during this day and uh, yeah i think it's really interesting we had another client uh they they're they're a hedge fund and that hedge fund invests in public companies um we help them kind of filter out companies that would be most um, attractive to them we we uh, reached out to people very old school guys they're on the east coast don't believe in marketing. In fact, most 99%, 99.9% 9 of hedge funds think that doing any type of marketing online is a ridiculous thing to do. <laughs> um, so we helped these guys and um, they closed uh, multiple million dollar deals within a, the first year of working with us. Um, and that's because they had an open mind and there was no competition. Now, part of the reason we were so successful is because nobody's doing online marketing in that space very small amount of people are doing online marketing. And so it's like a gold mine that people aren't, tap aren't tapping into. And uh, we have two testimonials for that. Um, other than that, you know, um, you know, we've, we've really crushed and we, we are really good at what we do. Um, it's just a matter of finding out what your niche is, who you are and, um, and how we can help execute. Go ahead. All right. Thank you for that, Frank. And uh, 
we are excited now to have our keynote speaker, Dr. Ogan Gurel. I'm going to read the ending of the introduction. And then Dr. Ogan, if you want to go ahead and request access. So I'm going to read again the end of Dr. Gorell's uh, introduction that we There he is. So very briefly, here we go. So Dr. Gorell uh, is, he holds academic appointments as a visiting professor at the Solbridge International School of Business and visiting teaching professor at DGIST with previous DGIST positions as vice chair, uh, distinguished invited professor in the management of innovation program. In the innovation world, Dr. Gorell is also chief strategy officer at CT Cells, chief marketing officer for Eidware. Sound Mind in Seoul, advisor for the Crest uh, Malaysia Digital Health Cluster and a venture partner at the Yasma Group with previous executive roles as Chief Scientific Officer for FRT, which is Field Robot Technology, CEO at Novum Waves in Seoul, Acting Chief Medical Officer at Nessa Hearing in Singapore, and advisor at Frazen uh, in Seoul. Authoring 14 peer-reviewed scholarly papers presenting nearly 200 conference proceedings and co-inventor on 10 patent applications for granted. Dr. Gurel has also given keynote addresses and other speeches at business and scientific conferences and seminars worldwide. Without further ado, we're very excited to have with us as keynote speaker today for day three of Capcom September 2020, Dr. Ogan Gurel. Welcome, Dr. Ogan. Can you hear me, Dr. Ogan? <clears throat> Greetings uh, from Seoul. So Thank you very much for you, uh, the Ogan. kind introduction and the opportunity to speak at Capcom 2020. Can you hear me? Yes, we, we can hear you. Dr. Ogan, thank you. Uh, I think it's uh, a delay. There is a little bit of a delay. Go ahead and just give your presentation and we'll keep up with you on the back end. Great, thank you very much. Once again, thanks uh, to Frank Aziz for the organization. Thank you. And uh, So I'll begin now, and um, I think I have the slides up for sharing. The title for today's presentation is New Paradigms in Health and Medicine in the World of COVID and Beyond. I'll be talking a little bit about some science, as well as some uh, uh, other background as it relates to uh, new paradigms and investment and so forth. So I'll start with a little quote here. So this is actually from Immanuel Kant. Two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe. These are the starry heavens above and the moral law within. It's a little bit strange to start a uh, investment webinar with a quote from a philosopher, but I think it will become clear a little bit later. So I'll be talking about um, overall four things. One is some key questions, I'm posing some key questions, many of which you have thought about uh, over the course of your careers. Second, introducing some fundamentals of this new paradigm shift. Third is, as I mentioned, some research or scientific results. And fourth are applications or potential applications that relate to the future of medicine and healthcare. So first, some key questions. One is why can't we just pop a pill and cure COVID? I'm sure everybody's thinking of that. Second is what is the future of diagnosis? Third is what is the future of therapy? 
Fourth, what is the future of technology? And lastly, how does life work? Uh, obviously, that question is just much more uh, general, but some of the points that I want to discuss today relate to that. So why can't we just pop a pill and cure COVID? Well, first of all, we have to answer the question, are viruses alive? We all have, we all know about antibiotics for bacteria, and they can be quite effective, of course. You basically pop a pill, uh, penicillin or, or whatever it may be, amoxicillin, and you get rid of the infection. Well, that's because bacteria are alive, as you know, but viruses are not. So there are only two ways to get rid of the virus. One is to physically destroy it, and the second is for it to be cleared by the immune system. There's no such thing as killing something that doesn't live. So killing a virus in the manner that antibiotics kill bacteria is not possible. So antibiotics cannot kill it. Uh, I think that one of the things that has really come out of this COVID crisis is the need, not just by investors, but by everybody to think of new paradigms. And so the concept of just popping a pill and get re getting rid of the uh, virus with a magic bullet or whatever is just not going to happen. So we have to think of new paradigms. So I'm, this is not bad news. I'm not trying to create uh, some sort of uh, doomsday scenario. But if you look at the history of viruses, we have antivirals that may suppress the virus, but no nothing ever really gets rid of it. So this is an opportunity to think about these new paradigms. So the second question is, what is the future of diagnosis imaging? So this is a diagram over time of all the different imaging modalities. And uh, we can see here x-rays, ultrasound, PET, MRI, CT. And one thing that's very interesting that there are no new modalities, no new kinds of radiology after 1985. We can say that in some respect, invention has stopped as current innovation in medical imaging is largely incremental. Second question, the third question, what is the future of therapy? This is a diagram of new drug approvals over the past half century as a function of research dollars pumped in. Uh, so this diagram is monotonically decreasing, or this chart. In other words, uh, less drugs per dollar of research over time. This has maybe blipped up a little bit, but in general, uh, we have a big challenge in this regard. So as of the turn of the century, it's about $1 billion to create one new drug. So apart from incremental advances, innovation has stalled in biopharma. A uh, very big company, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, very involved, obviously, in many diseases, but also COVID. George Ankopoulos, the uh, president chief scientific officer, writes, successfully inventing and developing any new drug or vaccine is quantifiably among the hardest things human beings try to do. This is reflected in the numbers. So as an investor, we think, you know, if something is really difficult to do and costs a lot of money, there must be a better way. Third question, fourth question, what is the future of technology? So I actually uh, wasn't in the introduction, but I had worked at the Samsung Co uh, Central Corporate Research Lab in the CTO office. And one of our jobs was to, for Samsung to uh, predict the future of technology. And we used a lot of techniques to do that, uh, forecasting and so forth. One of these techniques is called TRIZ, T-R-I-Z, which anticipates future technologies based on uh, established uh, patterns of evolutionary development of those technologies. So for example, landlines will evolve into some form of wireless communication. So generally speaking, a e-mobile system will evolve into some sort of field type uh, system. So for example, a rigid single steering wheel will eventually uh, evolve into electrical steering and a single leaf door will eventually evolve into some form of light uh, lock like we see in Star Wars, Star Trek, etc. So now when we apply that to medicine, we have what we would call a matter on matter paradigm. In other words, a piece of matter, namely a drug, has to bind to its target, a protein, or some device has to interact with the body in a matter on matter paradigm. That's the current paradigm, essentially medicine, which has been largely the case for thousands of years. So the future if we look at this evolutionary progression that I described, which has been well established in many areas, 
the future will be some form of energy on matter paradigm. And as an investor, you think, well, what kind of energy are we talking about? And when will that happen? When will that develop? And the purpose of today's presentation is to discuss that future paradigm and uh, lend some insight into those questions. The last question, more theoretical, maybe even philo philosophical, if you will, is how does life work? So this is a complicated picture of what we call a interactome, specifically of the proteome of the yeast. And uh, what that means, of course, is all the different proteins in the yeast and how are they interacting with the proteins being given by the nodes and the lines between them, the interaction between them. So as you can see, this is a big mess. It's a big spaghetti. And the concept that life comes out of this sort of just random hitting of proteins together, remember matter on matter, uh, is a mystery. And so maybe there are some other mechanisms, uh, scientifically based, of course, that might lend insight into how this miracle occurs. So where do we go from here? What will be the future of medicine and healthcare? And how can we better understand the fundamental mechanisms of life? So the story, uh, Frank Aziz was talking about the story, the path. Well, my path began over 30 years ago and I was an undergraduate and I did my senior thesis at Harvard with Professor Martin Karplus. Some of you may recognize the name. And I remember sitting at the desk in his office as he introduced me to the research program and so forth. And he was telling me that proteins are neither solids nor liquids. They are something in between. And that uh, phrase really captured my imagination and much of what we'll be talking about today will relate to this concept. Proteins are neither solids nor liquids, they are something in between. So second part of the presentation will be some fundamentals. We'll talk about proteins. Those are the targets of drugs, that's the machinery of life. We'll talk about some axioms of what I call protein electrodynamics, which is underlying this future of medicine. We'll talk about protein dynamics, what that means, some scientific questions, and what is terahertz. And finally, in terms of these fundamentals, terahertz medicine. So proteins, what do they look like? Well, here are two examples. This is uh, the backbone ribbon diagrams of myoglobin, which is mostly alpha helix, and basic fibroblast growth factor, which is mostly uh, beta strand. And you can see the androgen receptor here, human growth hormone, this is the surface van der Waals representation. The take home message from this slide is that proteins come in many different shapes and sizes, many different personalities, if you will. And what do proteins do? Most of you, of course, are familiar with this. Proteins are basically the machinery of life. They serve as structural proteins, storage proteins, transport proteins, hormones, receptors, such as the receptor, uh, the ACE2 protein, which is actually an enzyme, but it's a receptor also for the COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, contractile proteins uh, in muscle, defensive proteins, and the antibodies and enzymes. So here's an example of one of these. This is the voltage-dependent potassium channel that underlies how nerve cells uh, essentially transmit their impulses, their action potentials. And you can see this protein is making these large movements. And we call this protein dynamics. These proteins are not fixed molecules, as Martin Karpus said, but they have this very fluid behavior. So what are the axioms of protein electrodynamics? There are five of them. One is that proteins vibrate, and this is another uh, depiction of a protein vibrating, as you can see. Uh, it's very subtle. Two proteins are charged. They have positive and negative charges on their surface. This is acetylcholinesterase, uh, an enzyme protein that's involved in nerve function. And the red signifies a negative charge and the blue signifies a positive charge. These proteins are generally neutral overall, but they have charges distributed on their surface or around them. Third is Maxwell's equations. They look uh, somewhat complicated, but they are basically the equations of electromagnetism that define how radios work, how electronics work. And <clears throat> They basically say that if you have vibrating charges, they will emit radiation. And if you have uh, radiation, they can influence vibrating charges. And therefore, the fourth uh, axiom is proteins emit radiation and that proteins absorb radiation. And these are the five axioms of protein electrodynamics. You might say, why does that matter? 
Well, if proteins are emitting radiation, we can detect that. And likewise, just like we can make a radio play some music, we can influence those proteins using radiation. So Martin Karplis and others taught us that proteins vibrate. This is the original Nature paper from 1977, Dynamics of Folded Proteins. And uh, in 2013, that's why you might recognize his name, he got the Nobel Prize for some of this work related to molecular dynamics and so forth. So here's another depiction of that, uh, glucosamine 6-phosphate deaminase. So you can see that uh, dynamic behavior of the protein. <clears throat> and here's a, another one. This is xylanase. And this is the molecular dynamic simulation. So what are the frequencies? So they're vibrating. What are the frequencies? Well, here's another study uh, out of uh, Martin Karplus uh, comparing with neutron scattering, which is a form, uh, experimental form. And this is the theory uh, for myoglobin, one of those proteins, and this is the experiment. And it turns out that the frequencies for this protein, and many of them, we're not gonna go through all of them, of course, corresponds to around 450 to 600 gigahertz or 0.45 to 0 0.6 terahertz. And this is terahertz is 10 to the 12th cycles per second. Gigahertz is 10 to the 9th cycles per second. You may recognize this as being uh, slightly above the 5G band. Uh, and so these are the frequencies, generally speaking, in this range, the terahertz and sub-terahertz re region, that many of these large-scale protein motions manifest. So, uh, we also have terahertz radiation and infrared radiation, infrared radi related to heat and molecular bond vibrations. So infrared is sensitive to the small changes in backbone motions, but the differences in, in proteins are washed out. So infrared is not very good for really analyzing or diagnosing things based on single proteins. But with terahertz, we do see some signal, and I'm gonna review this result very shortly. And these large scale motions are responsible for protein function. So we can compare terahertz to infrared as terms of their potential. And uh, because of those difficulties, infrared is not really suitable for medical diagnostics. It doesn't have that functional significance and it's not likely to be applicable to medical therapeutics. So some scientific questions arise from all this. Do different proteins vibrate at different frequencies? Can we identify different proteins based on their spectrum? Yes, but not easy. The qu answers to these questions underlie diagnosis. Is the anharmonicity of these motions important? It may depend. Can one influence protein function by modulating the vibrations? We don't know the answer to this question yet. How far might these electrodynamic fields uh, propagate? Could protein dynamics, electrodynamics mediate specific attractive interactions between proteins so they can find each other at a distance and in a sense communicate over a distance? And the answers to these questions on the right underlie the potential applications to treatment. So what is terahertz? I know I jumped out uh, a little bit ahead. Uh, they are the electromagnetic energies between the microwave on the low energy side over here and the infrared on the upper energy side. So as I mentioned, they correspond to 10 to the 12 cycles per second or 10 to the 12 hertz. Until very recently, it was very difficult to engineer, in, and that's why they call this the terahertz gap, because uh, from, from a scientific perspective, terahertz radiation lies between the electronics regime, which deals with unbound electrons or conducting band electrons, and the photonics regime, which deals with bound electrons or valence band electrons. So it's kind of in a no man's land in terms of engineering. So we have to create terahertz by up frequency from the electronic side or down frequency from the photonic side. But ironically, terahertz is all around us, emitted by all living organisms as we are all composed of proteins. And it's also strongly absorbed by water. So terahertz is the last frontier in the electromagnetic spectrum. So you can see here the photonics approaches on the high frequency side, the electronics approaches on the low frequency side, and these are different methods. And you can see that the power output, power on the vertical axis is lower in the terahertz band here. So what are the natural sources of terahertz radiation? You can remember that quote from Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, two things fill the mind, the starry heavens above and the moral law within. 
Well, uh, the cosmic microwave background is a source of terahertz radiation coming from the sky. So the microwave peak is here, but there is a tail in the terahertz region. And the moral law within is meant to uh, exemplify life itself. So life uh, itself is emitting terahertz. So this is not all just fancy medicine or advanced science. The NYPD uses a version of this to detect weapons at a distance. So T-ray uh, machine, a high frequency electromagnetic natural energy is emitted by people and can penetrate many materials, including clothing. So a gun or a knife or other such concealed weapon is not made of proteins, it's made of metal. It does not emit this radiation, but the body does. And so you can uh, detect a uh, weapon at a distance in this way. And airports too, this is the basic principle behind those airport detection scanners, uh, the millimeter wave detectors that uh, many of you have experienced. So there are two technical challenges with this, uh, terahertz sources and the issue of water absorption. And when we're talking about terahertz medicine, the concept of applying electromagnetic radiation for these medical purposes, we can consider the structural imaging or this functional spectroscopy and some form of energy-based protein-specific therapy. And as I mentioned, in line with this concept of the natural progression of technology. The three principles of terahertz medicine is some form of residence with the targets, localization in some localized tissues like a cancer or something. And of course, these proteins, these targets need to have some function related to that. So the optimal targets would be proteins with significant charges and dipoles and large scale motions involved in their function, such as that potassium channel, and we call this electrodynamically active. This would be allosteric regulatory proteins, which are typical targets of drugs, ion and other channels, signal transduction proteins, transcription factors, and so forth. So you remember that the voltage dependent potassium channel here, uh, uh, has lots of charges, lots of big changes, or lots of big dynamics. As I, Albert Einstein once said, future medicine will be the medicine of frequencies. So third part of this will be some research results, and I will, I apologize, I will go through this quickly because some of it is uh, fairly technical. I'll talk about some protein spectroscopy in myoglobin and hemoglobin, some other studies, the open innovation program we did at Samsung, terahertz imaging of cancer, of Alzheimer's disease, 2D terahertz spectroscopy, uh, integrated source and sensor, some conclusions and technical challenges. As you can see, much of this work has been done in collaboration with various universities around the world. So uh, our first studies were with myoglobin, which is an oxygen uh, storage protein, and hemoglobin, which is an oxygen uh, a transport protein most of you are familiar with. And uh, we did a preliminary study and we saw some, and this is a absorption amplitude, this is frequency. We saw some specific absorption around 0.8 terahertz, 1.3 terahertz, and some broad absorption in the high frequency. This was published in the SPIE. We also did a study comparing hemoglobin and myoglobin, bovine for B, uh, myoglobin, human, and human hemoglobin. <clears throat> And we saw differences between myoglobin and hemoglobin. We saw species specificity, some difference between cow and human hemoglobin. We saw what we call a Stokes shift or emission. In other words, the protein is absorbing at the higher frequency, higher energy, and spitting out radiation at the lower frequencies. In other words, negative absorption. So we compare these results, 450 gigahertz, around 450 gigahertz here. This was the study back done a while ago. This was our terahertz study. So in conclusion, there's some broad but specific low frequency absorption around 450 gigahertz. Species differences are discernible. The globe and fold, the, the overall fold shows similar features, but there are differences between different proteins and possible stimulated emission. <clears throat> now you might say that spectra is not very impressive. It's kind of uh, undulating and it's not very sharp. But sharp protein resonances do exist and have been documented. This was out of the University of Buffalo with lysozyme. And you can see a sharp resonance around 1.5 terahertz. These degrees here are not temperature, but they're actually the angle of a terahertz beam with the protein crystal. So they align with the dipoles. You get a stronger and sharper resonance. And it turns out that these motions are actually 
correlated with biological function. So that's that same lysozyme. Uh, in the normal state, you have a hinging motion with the transition dipole in this direction. In the presence of a drug or inhibitor, you have a totally different motion, a twisting motion, with the transition dipole about 90 degrees uh, situated from the normal case. So the overall transition dipole in the inhibitor will shift. Uh, as you know, there are oncoproteins or oncogenes, and this is a study that showed that the oncoproteins in their wild type or normal state have different emotional characteristics than in their mutated state. Uh, this red is a heat map of the motion, a very general way of describing this motion. So cancer proteins are different in this regard from normal proteins. So while I was at Samsung, we, uh, I organized an open innovation platform that looked at many aspects of this. We looked at uh, the diagnostic side with tissues. We looked at uh, uh, trying to spread out these peaks using two-dimensional terror spectroscopy with MIT. We uh, tried to do the therapeutic side with the University of Southampton and the engineering side with a silicon-based integrated terahertz system at UC Irvine and also at the University of Texas. So in this terahertz imaging of cancer, um, which we published last year, uh, two years ago, we saw differences in uh, pathological samples uh, between normal and cancer tissue with uh, terahertz spectroscopy. Uh, we saw a similar uh, uh, differences between normal and disease in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I'm not going to go through these results in great detail, but uh, these were well documented. Uh, in, to answer the question, can we identify different proteins based on their spectrum? We did 2D terahertz spectroscopy with Professor Keith Nelson at MIT and have been granted a U.S. patent for that. And in producing the engineering of this, the sources, on a chip, a silicon-based CMOS system, terahertz frequency uh, synthesizer with wide locking range and uh, tunable uh, and relatively high power with Payam Haidari out of the University of Texas Irvine, uh, University of California Irvine. And we also did a similar project with University of Texas Dallas. So what does this mean? Well, most of you are familiar with the Star Trek tricorder. And obviously if you can put this on a chip, uh, you can miniaturize and have this as almost a handheld uh, device. So finally, can one modulate protein function via terahertz, that open question that I mentioned, that's still an unknown. There was a recent result just this year from Japan. This is uh, actin, a protein that's involved in uh, muscle motion, uh, muscle contraction. And through terahertz, you can see there's been a, a, a breakup or a change in this overall structure of this actin but this is still an open question. So terahertz interacts with proteins. Uh, most low frequency motions are in the sub terahertz range. Different tissues can be also uh, distinguished with demonstrated applications in cancer and Alzheimer's disease, using this for imaging and spectroscopy. And we believe that the technology, high power pulse continuous wave is very important and miniaturization via silicon based CMOS programs, uh, platforms. So finally, some applications, you know, what are the implications, why, new medicine, what are the potential applications, and so forth. So as I mentioned, we fundamentally need new approaches to diagnosis and treatment. This has been apparent for quite a while, uh, but uh, uh, it's especially apparent during this COVID crisis, as I described. So medical imaging has had no new modalities for over 30 years. Biopharma innovation has been declining for a half century and technology evolves to new paradigms. So energy on matter will be the future paradigm of medicine, uh, offering greater specificity, more non-invasive, greater effectiveness, lower cost, more rapid therapy development and the convergence of medicine and surgery. And this is not just uh, what I'm talking about. It was on Time Magazine last year, why it's time to take electrified medicine serious, more seriously. Google spin-off teams with uh, Pharma, GlaxoSmithKline, and there's many research groups growing around the world in this area. So I'm talking about one particular application of what we call the more broader area of bioelectromagnetics. So what are the potential applications? Cancer, uh, uh, infectious disease, uh, neurological applications, diabetes, wound healing, and many more. 
One aspect, for example, is in antibiotic resistant antibiotics or, uh, or bacteria that are antibiotic resistant. That's a, we talk about COVID as a big problem, but uh, very wide scale resistant antibiotics is maybe the next pandemic. So that's very uh, critical. And these antibiotics act on protein targets, such as on the cell wall synthesis with penicillins and protein synthesis machinery of the bacteria. So it's the same process of a, uh, a drug binding to a protein. And if we can use some electromagnetic approach, instead of designing a new drug when the bacteria is resistant, we just tweak the frequencies. So the development process is much faster. You've, talked, you've heard about the handheld thermal scanners. Well, imagine a handheld COVID scanner where you can just pick up in real time the presence of COVID. So we're doing a project, I'm doing a project with Middle Eastern Technical University in Turkey, uh, using terahertz to use surface plasma on resonance to detect uh, viral particles immediately. This has also been used in military applications. And so one reason why maybe many of you not, have not heard about it. So terahertz physics has been a challenge. Why now? Uh, there's been growing interest, uh, better performance in the detectors, miniaturization, of course, decreasing cost. Uh, I've written a book about this, not just the scientific papers. It's uh, Waves. You can find it on Amazon. It gives a lot of the background. Remember I mentioned that voltage-gated uh, potassium channel that describes, this is a chapter that describes some uh, uh, literary incarnation of this. You, so some closing to... thoughts, protein molecules are the machinery of love, a life, the target of drugs. They are not, they're solid, but not vibrating. They're not solid, but they're vibrating. Oops. And they have charges, so proteins can emit energy, they can absorb energy. So these proteins are like radios, giving rise to an entirely new approach to diagnosis and therapy presented around the world in the United States, uh, North America, Europe, Australia, and Asia. It's my pleasure to present here. I'll end with a couple quotes from Richard Feynman. Everything that living things do can be understood in terms of the jigglings and wigglings of atoms. This is Martin Karplus at his uh, Nobel Prize Celebration Symposium. Uh, I asked him the question, what would you suggest? I would do an experiment on an enzyme. If it works, it would be significant. In the beginning, technology is not always pretty, but dreams can fly and moonshots become reality. And thank you very much for your time. Uh, Dr. Hogan, can I ask you a few questions? Uh, can I ask you a few questions? Do you hear me? Oh, sir. Hello? Yeah, can, can I ask you a few questions? Sure, yeah. Uh, I took off my headphones because of that uh, time delay. It was very uh, disconcerting. No, it's okay. No worries. No worries. But uh, uh, I figured it out. So John Norris, um, I'm going to ask a few questions of my own, but just so John sure. Norris said, do some proteins have the same frequency? Uh, let me turn off the screen, by the way. Okay, great. Uh, that's a great question. And let me also increase my volume. So John Norris asked, do uh, some proteins have the same frequency? That's a great question. So just like drugs have side effects, and some of those side effects come from the fact that the drug binds not just to the target protein, but to other proteins. Yes, there's going to be some potential overlaps. But one of the reasons I showed you that slide about all the differences of the proteins is proteins have a lot of personality. Uh, you know, they're fat ones, thin ones, big ones, yeah. you know, whatever. My point is, uh, yes, there may be some overlap, but indeed uh, proteins are very diverse in their shapes, in their motions and so forth. So it's just a matter of, you know, uh, doing it. Uh, yeah. And of course, if there's uh, some frequencies that overlap, well, maybe you tune it a different way because it's not just usually one frequency. So just like with drugs, we uh, modify them to minimize the side effects. That's a good point, but I don't think it's, uh, you know, a deal breaker, as they say. Wonderful. Um, Egal asks, what about targeting specifically unintended consequences of crosstalk and also the physics of THC propagation in the body? Yeah, so that's a related question. You know, the unintended consequences, crosstalk, same concept. Uh, you know, ultimately, it's it, this is very interesting. From an investment standpoint or a regulatory standpoint, you might ask, what is this technology? Is it a drug technology or is it a device technology? 
it's actually both. It's a device that acts like a drug. So many of the concepts in the, you know, the drug world will apply. In other words, the side effects, the crosstalk and so forth. Mm -hmm. But the big difference, the big difference is that if you have a drug with a side effect, right? You have to basically start from scratch with a new compound. You can't, you know, just tweak it. But if you have, you know, you've selected a bunch of frequencies that you think are going to work on that target, but there's some crosstalk, you don't start from scratch with another one billion dollar program. You basically, you know, tweak the frequency so you minimize that crosstalk. So that's a very different paradigm. Uh, so yes, you know, the, this is not you know the magic bullet for everything. Solve cancer right at a snap of the finger, but I believe that the development is going to be completely radically different and much faster. Uh, John Norris also asked, "What do proteins vi What protein? What do proteins vibrate? What ev ev Excuse me. What evolutionary advantage here? Is it four AM there? <laughs> no. <laughs> Are you did a long day for you? It, uh, it's been a long week. <laughs> okay, yeah, long week. You know, did you tell the audience it's four in the morning here? Yeah, it's four in the morning over there in, in uh, South Korea. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, so it's my surgical training. That's why I, I can stay up. So uh, the, what was the question again? I, uh, what what John do Norris. proteins vibrate? What evolutionary advantage is there? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, one reason why this field, apart from the medical applications, is so fundamental is that all of you are familiar with nanotechnology. Everyone says nanotechnology is new. Yeah. It's not new. Proteins are the original nano machines, and machines, you know, are not just solid. They kind of move, you know. Uh, so, proteins from the very beginning evolved to be like these nano machines to do their job, to do their enzymatic job. It's another reason I had that slide about all those functions uh, and so forth. So, the flexibility of the proteins is from the very beginning essential to life itself. Uh, in fact. Uh, if you think about what is the origins of, you know, what, when does life begin? I mean, uh, what is life? Uh, I hate to be a little bit philosophical, but these proteins are almost living, if you will. Yeah. They're not, but they, they have this kind of very dynamic quality. So that's, that's not just an add on luxury. This is essential to their function as well as to life. So I have a question for you myself, and then I'm going to bring, try to bring Ira on live video. Um, okay. So my question is, regarding if we looked back a hundred years, we would look at things like bloodletting and things of that nature. Yeah, that right, right. We're, we're ridiculous now that we think yeah. about, it, right? Do you think in a hundred years from now we'll think about what we do now as ridiculous and not helpful? Well, I would say we've made some progress, obviously. Uh, yeah. But I, 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 this is another reason why I give this presentation about new paradigms and why investors need to think about this is a lot of things we take for granted now, just like the blood letters took for granted then, as, yeah. you, as you aptly uh, you know, made the analogy, are going to perhaps not be wrong, but uh, you know, not the best way. And the purpose of this talk, I think, apart from giving sharing this specific knowledge is just to open the mind that we need new paradigms. And indeed what we're doing now in some sense can be nonsense in a hundred years or 50 years or sooner. And yeah. I think one aspect of COVID is it's really revealed that. I mean, you know, I, I've also given a lot of talks about COVID um, and on television and whatnot. And so uh, I'm not a virologist myself, but I, I'm constantly talking about this. You know, viruses, there's no magic bullet. People are waiting for that drug to just kill the virus. It's just not going to happen. It, it's an impossibility because they're not living, as I mentioned. Right. So uh, we need new paradigms. So Ira, Ira has a question here. I'm, we're going to take yeah. him off video. Ira, so I'm a physicist turned drug developer, and I'd like to propose an experiment. Why not try tuning the frequencies in iontophoresis to see if it would be easier to get uh, to improve absorption of large molecules this way. I think that's a great idea. Uh, do you have my email? Let's uh, talk uh, offline in more detail. I think that's a great idea. I don't, but Frank can send it to me. Uh, it's right here. Oh, it's, yeah. Uh, Ogangarel at gmail.com. Happy uh, connecting. Iris, yeah, let's connect me, connect us. I mean, that's the purpose of a conference. But uh, yes, there are many 
possible experiments and I like what you just mentioned. So I'd like to explore some more. Thanks. Okay. Dr. Thank you. Physics is my favorite subject in school, by the way. I love physics. <laughs> yeah. Well, I should explain one thing. you guys uh, studied though, <laughs> but yeah. I love uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I should say one thing. So you might say this idea is, you know, fairly straightforward. Why isn't it, you know, more uh, being applied now? Well, this is a very interesting thing in the sociology of science. Uh, it deals with some very heavy duty physics and of course medicine. And, and these are very far fields from each other. And, and in fact, the physics that we talk about, that's one reason why I had the astrophysics uh, sort of uh, explanation, terahertz yeah. comes from astrophysics. Can you imagine astrophysicists, you know, doing medical technology? I mean, that's a big gap. Uh, so bridging that gap uh, is one of the challenges. Yeah. I feel medicine is more of an art than anything else, um, but also yeah. with, with science involved as well. Um, but it is an artistic endeavor. It's a very creative endeavor, in my opinion. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Russ Lehrman has a question. Are you thinking that energy will replace the current paradigm or will they both become tools in our therapeutic toolbox? Yes, of course. I mean, I, th oh. I think there's some element of potential replacement, obviously, uh, but at the same rate, I think... Uh, you know, there's always, not always just one tool and there may very well be complementary. I mean, we see that, for example, in radiation oncology, uh, adjuvant therapies and, you know, combined modality cancer therapies and whatnot, uh, which leads to another point. I do want to emphasize that ra uh, radiation or energy techniques are not new. Uh, radiation oncology is well established. The difference that I want to emphasize is that radiation oncology uh, and, you know, things like uh, radio frequency ablation or ultrasound or whatever, they use a physical mechanism to essentially destroy the tissue. What we're talking about is an energy mechanism that's acting like a drug to modulate the tissue. You know, drugs don't destroy the tissue. They, they, they act on the proteins, right? So that's what we're talking about, a biologically mediated energy on matter interaction. Interesting. Um, Really good uh, presentation, Dr. Ogan. No, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, we'd love to have you come uh, in person. We're going to do an in-person event. Of course, you know, we'll have to talk about that more in depth. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, make any introductions. You can share my email, by the way. And certainly with Dr. Spector, I'd love to follow up. Of course, of course. Sounds good. Thank you so much. And uh, we'd love to have you to come to California eventually. Yeah, uh, I'm sure it will happen. We'll, we will get over this. <laughs> okay. New, new paradigms or otherwise. Good luck with the rest of the conference, and thanks again for the opportunity, Frank. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Ogan. Bye. Thank you again to Dr. Ogan Brown for a wonderful keynote.